Hello and welcome again, everyone, with myself and Ben Richards, the property experts, live at five every Friday. Without fail, you'll have one of us or both of us. And we've got a jam packed agenda today. So, without further ado, let's go through the agenda. So, tender dramas, if anyone's tendering out there, stay tuned because we want to make sure that you're seeing and feeling the same things as us. XP surveys put on our third event, spoiler, spoiler alert, we sold out and we'll be going into detail about what we discussed at our event. Demolition and structures at TAME. TAME deep dive live at five on Friday. Cool, that's a, that's a few words to fit in one sentence. Was our most viewed uh, live. So we'll be sharing where we're at on that particular project. Re-recruiting, if you're building a team, growing a team, and you've maybe had team leave, how to have efficient re-recruiting tips that we can share with you. So our recruiting process for bringing in our amazing team multiple exits now i go to a lot of events and everyone talks about multiple exits so we'll be sharing a little bit more about how that can benefit your property investment or property development business we took a school day out with myself and aaron our quantity surveyor and acquisitions coordinator we'll be sharing who we visited in wales and why we went i was waiting for you to try and pronounce that <laughs> casteth casteth group casteth um the Property Black Book, Ben and I kindly got invited uh, to go to an event and we'll be sharing what that event is and way, why that might be beneficial for you to potentially attend that event. A completion uh, last week and a planning approval. So we'll be sharing a new deal in Central Suites. Buy to let products. If anyone else has out seen their 7% arrangement fees on finance products, we talked about it before, but we're going to be sharing a little bit of an inside scoop of how we make decisions on that debt. And then always, always, without without you know, wasting time, we always jump straight into Q&As. If anyone has any questions, please, please ask away. I'll put a challenge out there in one of these lives. I would love to have a question that Ben and I can't answer live. So challenge out there. If anyone's got a really, really difficult question and you want an answer, throw it at us and we'll see how we get on. And it can't be, what did I have for dinner last night or something like that? Yeah, it has to be a valid question. Cool. Onwards. So point number one, more tender dramas. If you've been tuning in over the last couple of weeks, you'd understand that we're, we've got five projects to start um, in the next couple of months. We've actually started one or two of those, but two of them particularly um, are stuck in the tender process at the moment because you know, the bill costs and the tender returns have come back, you know, way higher effectively than where we needed them to be. So I've been spending the last couple of weeks properly interrogating those tender returns. Um, and if you missed season two, episode four, which was from a couple of weeks ago, tune in to that where I give you my top tips in how to reduce bill costs and all the things you should be looking at to uh, to interrogate people's tender returns. Now, this week, I wanted to just touch on some more high level stuff. So if you've done all of that nitty gritty um, analysis of tenders, some other things that you can potentially do to look at to reduce your costs or come to a a better solution for you with a contractor. Um, so point number two on the list is um, once you've got the tender returns to effectively shortlist to your two preferable um, contractors and then go back to them. You know, if you're interrogating line items and you are you know, picking and choosing rates and saying look, you guys are a hundred pounds a square meter for stud work here, um, but this other contract is down at like 90 pounds a square meter. Okay, you know, why is there a deficit? Why why are you charging more for that that same thing? That's one thing. But then overarchingly going back to a contractor and saying, can you squeeze your rates in general? So if you were to say, argument's sake, drop by three percent as a carte blanche kind of across the board, that's obviously going to make a big impact on you. It obviously reduces their margin, but again, it depends on how busy they are and how much they want the work. One of the contracts, uh, one of the tenders that I've been reviewing came back a second time round and uh their rates have actually gone up by point uh by point three percent, um, which is the opposite of what I would hope to have happened. But um Interestingly, the feedback from that was, well, if we're reducing our total contract value from argument's sake, 2 million down to 2.6 million, some of the margin gets distributed back elsewhere. Um, 
for the smaller type of contract so that those those management levels and those extra prelims and everything like that so yeah i'm not sure i quite bought into that um but you know that was the response that i got um so yeah basically going back on a carte blanche and saying what can you do on your rates and your prelim preliminaries to win this work how much are you willing to budge um, and how much can we kind of reduce the the, the overall contract value so you know it's, it, sometimes they might just turn around and say we can't you know we've done everything we can to try and win this we're down as low as we can in terms of the margin um we don't want to go any 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 lower because contractors tradies you know that their, their prices are continually going up the contract doesn't, doesn't want to take the risk on reducing their margin um, and so be it but you know that that's the type of thing you should be doing shortlisting to two contractors and then kind of working with them both as much as you possibly can third thing is uh, meet up on site after you've got the tenders back and after you've done the strip out so going back with those shortlisted contractors, meeting them again on site, because I guarantee there'll be things that they pick out and they're like, oh, okay, I didn't realize that was already going to be done. Or now that you've exposed this, it means that we can reduce our price here and there because we added X, Y, and Z into our tender first time round. So meeting and get, uh, meeting again on site is a great way of um, just reviewing things um, with those shortlisted contractors. Ben, just to actually give a case study on that. Yeah, uh, with the project that we're sharing uh, later on uh, in the session today, which is Wallingford, um, the builder who we've got a really good relationship with, I said that he needs to re-render what needs re-rendering. And he said he currently has to price to re-render the whole thing because he doesn't know if he's going to have to re-render 50% of it or 100% of it by the time he's got on site, start playing around with it and seeing the condition of it. It's a great mm -hmm. list of building. So the prime example of that is once you've strip the render back or taking it you know to a point where i know render isn't normally part of a strip out but what we've agreed as i said look quote for all of it i'll trust you that by the time that you've stripped the render back we'll meet on site again and agree what needs doing mm -hmm. um, and i think that's a prime example of once you can see what you're dealing with because he said the way that any other builder would do this is charge for the whole rendering and just <laughs> yeah. be in in the quids in if they don't have to do it all or or charge you full amount anyway so i think that's prime prime example yeah that that does lead on to a different point that i don't have on here actually which is if you know there are further phases coming to a specific scheme make sure that you get a set of rates from the contractor and you you nail down and agree those rates so that if you're in contract with someone and you've got some further works like we will have for example at the old maltings because we're going to be building some extra units in the car park etc making sure that we do have a rate in there for the contractors foundation works their cart away their excavations all, all of that stuff and you fix the rates at that level so they're not coming back with new extortionate rates because they know they've won the contract and they're 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 you know basically in line to get that further contract um you're going to come unstuck if if you just leave it kind of open open-ended basically and not secure something first time round so yeah that's, that's a good extra point um point number four is you know if what we've been discussing with some of the contractors is working on a cost plus basis for certain items so things like big ticket items like the windows the doors you know we've got 170 grand's worth of windows and doors going into one of our schemes that's a massive ticket if we agreed with the contractor that on on some of those bigger items we just want to work with you on a cost plus you know that that for those that don't understand what that means is basically whatever they pay whatever the contractor pays to their subcontractor or whoever's supplying that supplying those um those specific items they just work on a margin on top of that so basically if you agree an eight percent margin for example you know where you stand they're getting the margin that they want you've got certainty because you you know you can then really nail down and find the best contractor for you and know that you're only paying eight, an eight percent margin on top of that for example um if things are really looking too tight with the main so, so everything that i'm talking about here is going down a main contract a tr traditional contract route where it's gone out to open tender four or five contractors on the list everyone's it's a competitive tender everyone's come back with their 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 prices and then you whittle down from there what you could do is go down a contract management route which puts a lot of responsibility and risk on you as the developer, but it means that you package up the individual items and manage that process yourself. So it's not for the faint hearted, trust me. You know, you'll have to have a project manager or a construction manager on site or a QS kind of overseeing that process, whereby 
they're the ones going out to the subbies. So you package up an electrical package, you package up a heating engineer package, you package up the basement as a separate kind of entity for a separate company to come in and do it itself. Um, and that way you are going to save money because you're not getting the margin on the margin with the main contractor, but you are doing a lot of the heavy lifting yourself and uh, managing that process and managing those packages. Somewhat con contentious with kind of warranties and who's actually providing warranties and whether or not your bank will allow that. But you know, it's it's a route that you could go down. Uh, design and build is another route. So with design and build, typically you get a bit more cost certainty, but you get way less control on quality. So, you know, if, if cost is a real key thing, it's kind of a bit too late for us now because we've done a full tender package. All of the details are there. We've been working with, obviously, the architects, the engineers to kind of pull that full package together. Whereas what you would do with a design and build package is just send them, essentially, this is what we've achieved planning permission for. Um, we want to work with you on a design and build um, contract. They would do all of the design work for all of the, um, uh, the, the construction build-ups and you'd provide a performance specification. So you just basically say the walls need to have a thermal property U value of, of X, and they would then design to that. Um, but again, it's a cost versus quality type conversation. Um, typically you get more rigid costs with a, a design and build contract, but because the contractors are factoring in risks to that, um, you know, the cost may not be less than what you do on a traditional basis, it is just more of a certain cost because um, they're taking the whole design and build piece. Hope that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, comment below. Or if you're a QS or a project manager and can explain it far better than I can, let me know. Um, but that's uh, th that's my sort of take on it. Um, and the, the the other sort of seventh point on here is is a conversation now we're having on going from smaller projects to the types of projects that we're now working on where it's a different type of contractor on smaller projects. It might be Barry and his gang of builders who, you know, been in the business 40 years, don't have a huge overhead. Their site foreman is the owner of the business. The site foreman is, you know, he's, he's on site and he's doing everything as well as, um, you know, invoicing of an evening and weekends. And, and in that situation, their overheads are far smaller. They don't have levels of management. They don't have an in-house QS. They don't have a construction director. And therefore, the prelims and the general rates and the, the the cost of that will be cheaper than a larger main contractor that does have all of those overheads, does have a team, does have the QS, does have the, the construction director, et cetera, where all of that management level um, is adding cost to you as the sort of end, end buyer. Um, so, yeah, hopefully a few things for, for you guys out there that are going through the tender process at the moment on various schemes. Definitely take a look at um, season two, episode four to um, reduce build costs in the first instance. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully those points are just a um, some extra tips for you once you've shortlisted a couple of contractors, uh, how to maybe reduce your contractor costs a little bit more and get to where you need it to be. So, Ben, Ben, do you think it's worth just touching on actual, if you want to go back on actual like build costs at the moment? Because uh, evidently, I I get I'm fortunate to get to see Alex Hearn from Silence Hearn Building Consultancy um, yeah. business. His overview of BCIS and where the the market went crazy and timber went up 100 percent in three months. Yeah, and labour, uh, you know, following that. And I was of the view that we would come into this year and actually start to see realistic build costs and and yeah. much more feasible with builders being more hungry for work. Yeah, but is that actually reality? I, th I think re realistic is now still really high you know that that's yeah. it, it's it's not going to go down to where it was you know material costs are still really high you know labor costs are still really high um it may have settled and we're no longer seeing you know from contractors i remember this time last year probably where a contractor was only giving a seven day time frame on their quote because things were changing so fast with um material costs for example that they couldn't give a 30 day time frame, which is quite standard. They were saying, you know, if we don't hear back from you within seven days, you know, our price is likely to increase because they couldn't take the risk on things going, going crazy. So it's certainly stabilized and we are definitely seeing contract. And by the way, this is, this is beginning of February, 2024, if you're listening to this, 
Um, we are, as an architectural practice, getting more and more contractors email in saying, we want to be on your tender lists. They're obviously shy on work. They want to pipeline for the next year or so. So there's definitely a lot more hunger from contractors where they're not putting in really stupid prices that they were just like, we'll put the price in. If we win it, we win it. Happy days. Um, like we were seeing a year to, to 18 months ago that, you know, they are sharpening their pencils. They're opening a conversation. You know, we're, we're sort of, yeah, having conversations that I would like to have where um, they're open to reducing rates and, and all that sort of stuff. But bill costs are still expensive. And if, if I give a really high level, simplistic kind of overview of where we are on certain things, we're at about £142 a square foot for office to resi conversions. Um, I've just analysed some airspace um, stuff where it's about £185 to £200 a square foot for, for purely like airspace things. Um, Colney Hatch Lane, which is a big basement and um, internal refurbishment, is like 280 a square foot um and that's you know that's that's a good you know not prime area of london but a, a you know affluent area of london where prices are slightly more expensive but um you know you're, you're not going to be at the 100 pounds a square foot conversion level anymore um you're not going to be building new builds at 200 pounds a square foot certainly in in the southeast um and one thing i guess i think i've learned through this whole process is to spend more money up front getting a quantity surveyor to do a do a full cost appraisal at an early stage um rather than just taking a blanket pound per square foot rate because it's just every project is different it's it's moving very fast the industry and um it's not worth getting to the point where we are now where you know we're having to try and pinch all over the place to try and get it to where we need it to be very good cool XPS event. Yeah, so we had um, our third event last night. Um, I think the first event, we probably had 15 to 20 people. Second event, we had 20 to 25. We had 38 people on the list um, yesterday. Not all of them turned up, but most did. Um, so it was definitely our, our, our most well-attended event, um, a room mainly full of architects, but we had some developers in there, some investors, some constru um, construction professionals. Um, and it was a really, really great event with David Kemp talking all about the planning permission and permitted development rights that are coming in and the government changes that are happening this year. Um, and we had Claire Truman of um, she is a conservation architect, effectively talking about how to work with heritage assets and listed building um, listed buildings. Um, some absolutely yeah amazing insight for for the architects that were in the room if you're interested in coming we're going to be doing these probably every quarter they're based in henley on thames um, they're free we'll put on a spread put on some drinks um we obviously would love to work with architects from an xp surveys perspective and you know fundamentally that's why we're putting it on but it's giving us some some great insight to um what's going on in the market who's working on what what developers are looking for what architects are you know uh, are working on uh, and we'd love to see you there. So if you're interested, yeah, do make sure you check out all of our events on Eventbrite um, or DM, you know, Jack or I contact XP surveys on Instagram um, and we can put you on the list for the next one. And for those that are listening on podcast, thank you very much. Um, I spoke to somebody earlier who I don't think he realized that we sort of start these things on YouTube. Um, he's like, oh, I'm only up to episode whatever. Um, and he was talking about stuff that was happening in November, December last year. So I was like, okay, that's that's great, but you're probably three months behind because we haven't quite yet caught up. We are releasing about two new episodes a week, but fundamentally, if you are on the podcasts, um, this started as a YouTube video at 5 p.m. on a Friday every week. We then repurposed the video content into audio format, put it on Spotify, put it on Apple, put it on all the, uh, the relevant podcast platforms, um, but we are slowly catching up. Um, with the lives so yeah thank you very much if you are tuning in on the podcast but do head over to youtube um subscribe over there so that you get first dibs on watching the new ones every week cool and i'm going to make this screen a lot bigger for you again i guess this is another reason to tune in on youtube rather than podcast because you cannot see what i'm talking about right now and what i'm showing you is the progress we've made on the project in tame which is st andrew's court um really really 
great progress this week. Considering we started Thursday last week, um, all of the structural work has been done. All of the steel work is in. All of the walls that need to be demolished um, have been demolished. And we are starting to now see the spaces come to life with the metal track partitioning going up throughout the building. So I love this stage of the, the process and I'm looking forward to going on site on Thursday next week um, because you start to get a real sense of how an office now becomes a residential home. All of the bedrooms are, are allocated. You can see where the bathroom's going to be. You can start to get a real sense of the space um, and what it's going to look like. So, yeah, just wanted to show a progress update on that. If, if you want sort of day to day updates, do tune in on um, Instagram and, and follow and subscribe to um, XP Property over there. Cool. Re-recruiting. And I thought I'd give a bit of an overview. We did actually touch on um recruiting and i'll have to dig out and comment uh, in the sections and what episode that exactly was but fundamentally for most um business management uh for most admin admin based roles we tend to use indeed.com that is definitely by far our best way of pulling cvs in front of our faces so that we can pre-qualify those cvs and hire people if we're looking for more specialist roles linkedin pushed uh, recruitment and also getting recruiters on board one top tip for recruiters make sure that you don't have uh, a rebate clause well you do have a rebate clause up to 100 percent up to someone's probation that's top number tip because if someone starts in your business isn't any good and they leave before probation or you want them to leave uh, probation it gives you full flexibility from an employment perspective but also means you get that that uh, recruitment fee rolled into potentially a next role or completely back um, and we had unfortunate news that our business manager in xp surveys is leaving and i just wanted to share how I basically covered a lot of ground in a very short period of time to make sure that we could fill the role very quickly. And now the way I did that is because we've recruited for this role before, and it was actually coincidentally nearly two years ago, and that's how we found the existing person in our company by Indeed, I went back to the same job advert and pulled up all the CVs again. Now, this is just expediting a process of making sure that you can really get through a lot of potential candidates really quickly. It's actually how recruiters do it. They go on job boards where CVs get uploaded for certain jobs and you can do keyword searches. But what we've actually done there is we've gone back to a job advert that's two years old. Um, we've got people that have already applied for the role and are interested in the company. Two years is quite a long time. So by that time, they might still be looking, they might not, or they might have moved into a different business. So I downloaded a bunch of CVs, contacted a bunch of people, and off the back of that, we managed to fill the role within one week, um, which is pretty quick. Um, <clears throat> we were against the clock because it's four weeks notice. And essentially, Ben and I don't want to be answering the phone every day because we're getting surveys in. So we've managed to expedite that process to find a new candidate that's starting pretty quick in quick, pretty quick succession. And that's just a top tip. If you're recruiting in your business and you put a job role on Indeed, it's not just the CVs for that particular role there and then. It's also potential CVs for other roles in the future or the same role if you have to backfill it. So just a tip there, if anyone is growing a team and expanding a team, I know that some property investment and development businesses are lean and they bring in consultants and some grow a team like Ben and I have. I think we've got almost 30 employees across Aura, XP Surveys, XP Property and Central Suites. So obviously we're in recruitment mode and that's just a top tip that hopefully help someone in a bad situation because someone's handed them a notice and they need to they need to pedal quickly to get that role fixed. Very good. Cool. Multiple exits. If you go to any panel events uh, and anyone asks the questions, what's the top tip for de-risking deals? All the experienced people will say multiple exits. Now, if you're watching, the image in front of you is the second house that we bought on a street in Abingdon. We're now bidding on the third house on the same street in Abingdon. And coincidentally, the house that you can see in the image is a, a standard three-story house, three-bedroom property, loft already converted. We bought, we developed, and we sold it. The one opposite this one, so the one you're looking at is number eight. The one opposite this one is number three, which we bought as our very, very first HMO. So it's very, it's got a very close place to our hearts because uh, it was the very first HMO that we posted, actually very first house that we had bought. Um, so we love this street. We know the street inside out. We know the building makeup of the houses. There's essentially, uh, you know, little quirks with these properties and we're super used to them. Now, we're actually under offer on the third house on this street. 
And we want our business would benefit more so for a flip more than a HMO. And so I just had these blinkers on and I'm just looking and reviewing and pulling the numbers together, which you can see on the screen, the middle column here to flip the house around. It's just a draft appraisal. So we're buying for 265. Our refurbishment and, it, and it's actually got planning for an extension uh, will be about 120,000 pounds. And when you actually pull through the cost of capital to get the deal done, the profit, the sales costs is about 50K profit in it, which is our very, very, very minimum for a flip. So we try and do about five of these a year. Critical, you know, you need to be doing quite a few if you do have the infrastructure like we do. And it just wasn't that exciting for me. And we were really struggling because we were like back and forth with the agent to try and get this agreed. And we were just really, really struggling to get to a value that we were comfortable with and they were comfortable with. And at the end of the day, it all draw down to what the vendor want was a special price that they couldn't budge from. And I was struggling to get to that value. Then what I thought to myself is, let's just have a look, see what it looks like as an HMO. So that's exactly what we did. So I ran the numbers of an HMO and with say, flying sailing colors, it's an outstanding deal that we should be buying and adding to the portfolio as an HMO. Now back to the original point, our business would benefit more from a flip. So our, our plan now is, to hit the scheme, rip it apart, back to brick renovation, deliver the scheme that's deliver the planning that's to, uh, in place, put certain, um, I suppose, sort of preemptive services in the property so that we can convert it to a, an HMO if we need to, but deliver it as a flip. If we don't get the, if the market's not there for it, uh, and the market's actually got worse in sort of six to eight months, we always have the option to trade it out to an HMO. Um, make sure that we can then let it out, refinance it, get the majority of our money back out and have a 31% return on cash left in or a 16% return on equity. So if you look on the left-hand column, the flip looks like a 16% IRR for our investor and our 50-50 profit split, 25K to us, 25K to them. But actually on the HMO model, it, it performs really, really well. So I suppose this is just sometimes I need to re, re, you know, remind myself that there's more than one option for every project and make sure you run through all the options before even bidding, because it might change your stance on how aggressive. Jack, I think we've lost you. It came down to a result of me running the HMO stack to getting the confidence, go, yep, let's do it. That price is fine. So exits are everything. You can do this with commercial. But if you're buying a commercial building and there's planning risk, make sure it works underpinned on the commercial valuation and make sure you're buying it for that value. So always prioritize your exits is basically the moral of that story. <laughs> Very good. And um, we've had a comment in from someone called F. Obviously, don't know the full name on YouTube, but hi, guys. How do you get private funding from private investors if you don't have a track record? And where do you find them? And we'll, we'll get on to that at the very end in the Q&A. But thanks for the question. If anyone's got any other questions, then do let us know. On to point number six, Casteth Group. Casteth Group. Kasteth. So if any if anyone knows Mr. Dorian Payne, go and follow him on, and send him a message and ask for some of his time because he is the second best developer in the United Kingdom after us um no I'm, I'm severely joking on that he's a really good friend and you know for a, i think he's late 20s to be delivering a 200 million pound pipeline in a construction company that doesn't actually require a lot of his time he's an absolute bookworm uh he's he loves he's a he's a bit of a self-development junkie and he is a wisdom of knowledge and in my opinion the definition of you know like a someone that the the you know I, I admire how he sits as a managing director of his company because it grows without him and i think that's the sign i've always been told the phrase a good company runs without you a great company grows without you and he has really put in the knowledge and expertise and work ethic to get that going so hats off to dorian um so me and aaron decided to venture out there on wednesday we did a school day out with our pack lunches and we were storming around the castell office as well as going to sites um, but it's just to give you give you a, a pre warning that um, we recorded a podcast where I um, interviewed Dorian and Dorian interviewed me. Uh, just to give you a little bit of inside scoop of questions that I asked Dorian. One of the ones that was at the forefront of my mind is why don't you have a business partner? Um, and it was very interesting to hear his response to that. Another question: Have you ever doubted your business? Um, and he said he had. So if you really want to 
hear the details on that, please comment and I'll make sure that you let you're known when the, the podcast goes live. I asked him, what would you do if you started again? Uh, and I said, what would you, what do you wish you could do, but you can't? Because with people like Dorian, he believes everything is possible. So I thought if I asked the question in that way, he might tell me some fun stuff that no one knows. And he did. So um, I'm excited for that to be launched. And Aaron um, basically sat in the office with their their progression and land teams. They're a, they're a land-led um, social housing developer. And as mentioned, they're delivering two, uh, 200 million in development. All of it is direct to landowners that they're taking through planning. And fundamentally, where XP property is currently at, we've got a lot to be delivering this year. We want a piece of that land-led stuff in 2025. So we've been basically sent Aaron in so that their land team can learn off Aaron, vice versa. We all benefit, and that's pretty much it. So word of advice for anyone, it's a good idea to, you know, sometimes swallow that competitiveness and just help each other out because fundamentally, I don't want to be developing in in uh, in Wales and Dorian can't afford to develop in Henley. So we can easily help ourselves out. Yeah, he, he's an absolute legend. I think, you know, if, if you didn't know him, you'd think he's like 50 odd years old and got the, you know, the 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 wise um, wisdom of, of somebody that's been in it for 30 years. But he's like Jack says, like 28 years old or something ridiculous. Um, yeah. And he's doing incredible stuff. So fair play. Just a quick touch on um, an event that Jack and I attended uh, near uh, Ascot earlier this week. It's run by uh, Lisa Knott and Jivan, who um, have a huge black book of contacts. And they've decided to join forces and kind of share the wealth in that black book and try to bring it, you know, tr try to bring them all together into one place on a monthly basis. It's called the Property Black Book event. Um, they started in Windlesham near Ascot. They are opening a second um, event in Surrey somewhere. And I think they've got plans for another one as well. Um, it was a fantastic event. I'd say there were probably 40 people in the room, all from the property and construction industry. So if you are looking for architects, construction professionals, engineers, timber suppliers property investors property developers um it was a yeah it was a great place to really enhance our contacts it gave me some great um contacts to use within both xp and aura um i'd highly recommend it, it yeah it's, I'll, it's I'll just like, i'll just like to dive in and say um i don't want this to come across big-headed or like i'm an absolute activist but it's very rare that i go to a property event and don't know anyone and I literally knew not one person. So it was it was very refreshing to be meeting new faces, new people, finding out about that business. I actually found it quite fun because um, it's all, always fun to go and see familiar faces. But I think if you're pushing yourself out of that comfort zone and having to meet, I, I actually don't think there was one person I didn't speak to apart from one person that you mentioned, Ben. But always try and go to an event where you don't know anyone because you'll always learn more, meet more um, and build new relationships. Yeah, I think when you're you, you do a lot of the stuff that we've done in the last five or six years, which is going to property investment specific events, yeah. you do see the same people. Um, it's it's the same old people doing the presentations. This was, like you say, very much kind of on the fringe of anything else that we've done. Um, just a selection of people in the service provider um, industry within construction, within the property. Um, but you didn't have, you know, people that were wanting to get into rent to rent and deal sourcing and it, it was it was none of that it was purely construction and design professionals um with some amazing contacts and lots of great services to offer so yeah can't recommend that event enough cool um if you are listening and haven't seen this before we do offer um one-to-one -one consultancy if you want to grow your business jack and i have been growing seven figure service-based businesses over the past couple of years and also eight figure um property development um businesses so if you want to scale and grow and you need some guidance to help you do that um we do offer our um services on an hourly rate basis um to help you push things forward um, we're starting a small boardroom group or continuing our existing boardroom group by looking for more people to join. 
Um, so if you're interested in a sort of mastermind type vibe of 10 to 12 people in a room once every month, um, looking at deal analysis, again, extending kind of contacts um, and pushing people towards their goals. Um, yeah, do get in touch. We, we, have had another, we have had another question quickly, which we'll get on to you and Roger. Hi, guys. What percentage interest are you having to offer private investors at the moment if you are taking capital as a loan rather than offering them equity in the project? That's another one we can touch on later. Cool. So Wallingford. Um, so last Friday, we completed on this property, which we were ecstatic to get over the line. We, it's a mixed use property in the hut is actually in is is on marketplace which is actually like literally in the marketplace probably one of the most local uh, so, sorry central location properties that we've got in with it within a town um and we agreed to buy this about six months ago um it was listed at five hundred and forty thousand pounds we managed to secure it for four hundred thousand pounds we also paid the vendor four thousand pounds to do a three-month delayed completion for a number of reasons one because that's actually cheaper than our cost of finance to buy it and two because we submitted in my opinion quite a ambitious planning application um so again back on exit so when we picked up this property we kind of were looking at flats you know maybe splitting the upstairs into two flats and keeping the retail as it were but as you can see it's quite a stumpy sort of short and short and shallow building and quite frankly 30 percent of this building is stair core and it's got you know weirdly laid out staircases which we which we had to overcome so the best compromise and the best exit value that we could actually figure out with the property is to create a seven bedroom five bathroom hmo um so i know what you're thinking you're buying a site for four hundred thousand pounds and it's going to be part retail and part hmo we believe that the retail space is probably worth anywhere up with from 150k, um, which means we're picking the uppers up for about 250k, and it will be a seven bed HMO in Oxfordshire. Um, but yeah, so we 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 put, submitted planning, and fortunately, on Wednesday night at 10 p.m., uh, it was granted uh, with a bit of back and forth with the council. Um, we had a fun bit of dialogue towards the end where they were putting some planning conditions on our planning application. And I actually went back to them and said, I'm happy with all the conditions on the agreement that you have to respond with us when we're submitting details within 10, 10 working days, to which they completely said, that's not possible. Uh, we can't agree to that. And I said, what is possible? And they just came back and said, we're not putting down a time frame. <laughs> it's, it's very much like the councils nowadays. I mean, 10 working days to review a little bit of a detail on some architrave and come back to a, a developer that needs to crack on in my opinion, is quite a lot of time, but there you have it. But my, anyway, ears did, my ears ears did perk up then. I was like, oh, interesting. Pretty sure they're going to say no. Oh, yeah, yeah okay. they did. I thought, I thought, let's give it a go. Let's give it yeah, a go. Yeah, why not ask? You don't ask, you don't get. But anyway, if you're not following Central Suites' channel, we'll be sharing progress um, photos. It's going to be quite a heavy back-to-brick renovation. This is actually the property that completely needs re-rendering, completely needs re-roofing, and we're, we're a terrace uh mixed use site in the middle of town with a footpath in front of us so we also got to deal with scaffolding which is going to be equally as fun what, what's so anyway, the, budget? the budget is about 170k all in um hopefully my builder's not watching this because he's currently pulling together his tender um <laughs> yeah 110k <laughs> uh he won't be watching this he's he's uh definitely not on the social media platforms um, so yeah, about 170, which I think the retail will probably knock out, um, for, for about 25 K. Um, and then we tend to average a budget of about 20 K per bed. So if you do the maths, obviously seven times 20, so should be there or thereabouts, but there is quite a lot of external work. We have to put a new lintel in above the retail shop as well, uh, which is fun because the structural engineer believes that the existing lintel, because it's such an old building is still timber. Uh, and there's some brickwork having a little bit of a dance around and, and deciding to lose shape. But we'll deal with that. It's all part of the job of being a developer. But um, yeah, follow our channels. We're super excited to get cracking on it. It's actually going to turn out to be a very high co cash flowing uh, project. We've been sharing our long Hambra, which is 12 bedroom over four flats. And as, a, as an ROI, this is sort of up there with that one, which is a huge sort of 40% return on cash left in, 
um, and like an 18% return on equity, which is really the strong numbers that we want to be focusing with. Um, and we managed to buy this with, coincidentally, similar to sort of Ewan's project, and I'll cut, we'll come on to this at the end. We bought this with a loan investor because we're going to keep it in our HMO portfolio on a fixed coupon um, at 15%. Nice. Um, on a percentage thing, um, contingencies for these types of listed buildings, I mean, we typically factor in about 15%. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd recommend everyone think about having a relatively sizable contingency for these types of things, because when you start uncovering things in listed buildings, you uh, yeah, you just don't know uh, what's going to happen. I mean, I haven't actually told Jack that at Marlow there was a bit of a leak um, at some point and the ground floor front part of the listed building, the joists are not in a good way. So you know, there could be some rectification work for us to do in in our Marlow project because that's listed as well. Um, so, yeah, you don't know what's going to happen when you start uncovering things in listed buildings and listed building officers can often get quite pedantic about what they want you to do or what they don't want you to do, for example. Yeah. I would I would actually say in the last two years, banks need to see 10 percent minimum anyway. Mm -hmm. on True. any scheme that could be any scheme so if anyone hasn't got a t you know a 10 percent contingency in their their deal analyzer and they're sending that deal over to banks it needs to be 10 percent regardless whether it's listed or not but as ben recommended 15 percent for a listed building is suggested um cool we got questions flying in today hope everyone's got a very free evening um on to the the last but not least important um topic which is buy to let products this was actually a question put in our xp property community whatsapp group um, and it's something that I did on a on a buy to let that I've got, and I'm refinancing now. Um, you, let, let's just assume your 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 it could even be your personal home, or a buy to let property, or even a HMO property, or even a commercial property. You're coming to a new you know a new market where you need to refinance your property, and potentially you need to think, in my opinion about when you're actually going to sell or exit that property because for me that should come into a factor for running an analysis for two year five year fixed tracker or whatever or variable so what i did with this particular property i'm looking it's on the open market i'm looking to sell it if it doesn't sell very quickly i will rent it out and what i'm doing in that process is i'm looking at refinance products for when it's let let out now I'm trying to think to myself, do I want to keep this house for five years? I'm trying to sell it now. Or do I want to hold it for two years and rent it out for two years? Now, this shows pivotal information that enabled me to make a decision on which finance product I'm going with. So I believe that I could go out there, for example, if you can see it on the screen, Lend Invest, two-year product. They're going to lend 350K against the asset, which is about 70% loan to value. There's a 7% arrangement fee. So I've got that cost in there. There's the rate, which is 3.79%. So high arrangement fee, low rate. I've got the cost per annum, and then I've got the cost per month. And then I've got the early redemption charges within two years. So if I bought this property, funded it with LendInvest, I know my cost to get in out in year one and out in year two. Now, what I did to compare with that is Paragon five-year fixed, pretty much the same net day one. Obviously, it's fixed for five years, lower arrangement costs. So in comparison to LendInvest, which has got a high arrangement fee, low rates. This has got a lower arrangement fee, 5% is still high, but lower with a slightly higher rate. We then have our cost per annum. We then have our cost per month. And then I work out exit year one, exit year two. So what that enables me to do is actually see the cost of capital if I were to buy the product, put it on a, a fixed product and exit in year one and exit year two. And what this told me is if I exited in year two on Paragon, which is on a five-year fix, it's cheaper so that and I could also then exit onto a new product in the finance market. So for me, it's the cost of capital that's that's really important to actually look at because it's really difficult sometimes when you've got terms A, terms B, 1% arrangement or 2% arrangement and the rate, and then another one that's a five-year fix, but different, but stipulate it to your plans with that property. If you're planning to hold it forever, look at the cost over five years. If you're looking, you know, if you're looking to get rid of it in any time soon, look at the date that you might exit with the early redemption charges. Jack, the, the ERCs on that, I noticed yep. that they're 2% for the five-year Paragon and 2% with the Lend Invest. Normally on a five-year mortgage, I, I normally see a, like a, a, a waterfall, like, you know, 5% mm -hmm. ERC in year one, a 4% in year two, 3%. 
that's pretty good then from Paragon if you can own if you can exit after two years with just a two percent fee. I mean, and this is why you've got to look at it because if you said to me before I saw their term sheet on Paragon, what are the ERCs? I would have said five four three two one. Yeah. Um. Or or even I've seen five 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 zero. Um. <laughs> so it's what it's and and that would have cost you know that we're talking about thirty grand here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah massive. If, if you don't if you don't look at that detail, so it's hundred percent worthwhile doing like cross you know cross checking the two. Um, coincidentally paragon came out and valued it and don't like the property anyway so i'm gonna have to do another one um but that's bang that's, that's a different story yeah cool good um cool we have had a, a flourish of questions come in um f we'll come on to that one you and we we read yours out we had another one from f which i did want to touch on quickly hey guys another question do you offer a mentorship program for beginners effectively no not really i mean a lot of the stuff that you will learn from this um, these conversations and the podcast is typically quite advanced stuff. We're not really programmed up to to sort of work with beginners. Even our our boardroom groups are um, tailored to those that already have some property experience, want to grow their business. Um, so yeah, we're not really set up to be giving baseline beginner sort of input. That being said, from a one to one consultancy perspective, you know we we kind of have to help anyone. And then another one, which I think is quite quick before we get into the more detailed ones. Um, I'm going to try and pronounce this and probably make hash of it. Carola Grimer. Thank you very much for the question. Um, what kind of ROI are you looking for when it comes to investing in a HMO? Is it correctly understood that you buy it, rent it out using an agency and with a long term goal? Or do you frequently sell them? I'll just touch on this before Jack kind of goes off on one. Um, it's I mean, from my from my perspective when you when you're developing a hmo you're typically doing it for the long term you, know, you want that income over a certain amount of time frame selling hmos is, is not going to be for everyone's bag so you're kind of limited you're limiting your exit market there and you're probably not going to get like a, a decent sales yield for just one-off hmos that you've created for example um sometimes we do sell and like Jack was saying you know sometimes you have to change and flip your exit and have those multiple exits available to you um, and then from an ROI perspective, I'll let Jack kind of. Yeah, cool. Well, so yeah. so we've been building a HMO portfolio for five years. So we actually look at a few metrics when it comes down to our ROI. So we actually do bricks and mortar valuations on our HMOs. Apart from the one I shared earlier, none of our HMOs are seven bedrooms plus. So we do bricks and mortar valuations. They're actually st quite strong in our location that we operate in. We aim for a 20% return on cash left in as a return on our cash. Why is the question you're probably asking? Because when you finish the HMO and put it on a five-year fixed product, you get all your money back out before the five-year fixed product ends. So it's a very scalable and safe business model to make. Uh, we also aim for a minimum of 12% return on equity. Now you ask yourself, what is equity? Once you've refinanced, you've got a bit of cash left in maybe, or maybe very little, or you maybe even pull some cash out, but there's equity sat in that asset and if you're making sure you're getting in excess of 12, we actually normally hit 15 to 18%. You're making sure that that capital that's in that asset is working really hard for you because essentially you could sell that asset and put it in other places. So that's my answer to ROIs. That's what we aim for. As far as it goes for um, actually keeping and, and holding long term and do we get an agency involved, um, I can actually talk for probably England on this. Um, but when growing a HMO portfolio, I'm not a massive fan of potentially buying one HMO uh, and trying to, you know, use that as a cash flow engine. I think that the real money in HMOs, and it is good money doing it that way, buying one and giving it to an estate agent. But I think the real money is getting to critical mass. So getting to a point where, for an example, you've got 100 bedrooms. I think the actual teetering point of in our location of where you need to bring in an estate manager is actually around the sort of 40 bed mark. So once you get to critical mass, you bring that management in house. And then rather than paying an estate agent 100 grand a year to manage your 100 beds, um, because that's roughly what it probably will cost you, what you will actually end up doing is paying someone around 25,000 pounds per year to manage that. So you're making 75k a year net to bring that management in house. So I hope that's answered your question. So for me, HMOs are super long term. And I also believe in building a big portfolio because then it, it, you build critical mass to deliver that. 
Nice. And if you if you have got value from this, we're going to talk about two other questions that have come in. But um, what we'd really love you to do is either one, share it with someone that you think can get value from this a conversation as well. Two, make sure you subscribe on YouTube if you're watching on YouTube. And then also follow us on all of the relevant podcast platforms so that you get a notification when uh, we go live next time. So, yeah, thanks for that. And on to the first question that came in from Mr. F. Um, hi guys, how do you get private funding from private investors if you don't have a track record and where do you find them? Thanks. I mean, we started, we've, we've built our, our developments and, and portfolios from very little of our own money, really. Um, most of our schemes have been with external private investment. We've raised about 14 million pounds in equity um, and also about 40 million pounds worth of senior debt from various banks. But those private funders either come in on an equity basis where they share the upside, share the share the profit, share the downside, or they come in on a you know effectively a loan agreement on a, a debt basis. Um, we found them in all walks of life, um, and one thing we would absolutely recommend everyone does is tell people what you're doing. You just never know where where things uh, where money comes from. Um, you know, a conversation in a cafe with someone you you don't necessarily think would would have 200 grand sitting around has has often surprised us by saying, "Oh, actually, that sounds really interesting." You know, I've got this pool of cash um what can i invest in and what returns can you give me for example um but yeah don't don't be afraid to talk to people about what you're doing but very early on we were hitting a lot of networking events a lot of property investment property development um like angel investment type events and just getting to know people it is all about relationships and trust they, they, they need to know like and trust you um so you need a lot of touch points to kind of get people over the line um yeah, I think if you're if you're honest and transparent about the fact you don't have much track record, but you you know show um, transferable skills, you show intent, you're hungry for it, um, you show that you're knowledgeable and you you're sort of academically kind of clued up through training or watching these types of things, listening into podcasts. Um, you know that's going to come across really well to an investor. So fundamentally, the investment the investor is going to want security on assets and and um you know the amount of security that they're given will will going on to you and sort of question um you know the amount of security they get will somewhat depend on the the returns that you give them um but yeah you know we we know a lot of people that don't have a track record or a history in property that have raised hundreds of thousands millions of pounds because they've um they, they are investable people and if you look back at i don't know episode whatever it was where jack was talking about do you back the jockey or the horse um most of the time investors that, that we've met and work with are more inclined to back the jockey which is us as the investor or developer than the horse which is the development itself you know they're, they're buying into you as a person or people um and they want to invest with with you rather than necessarily just the deal I completely, completely resonate. And actually, Dorian and I talked about this topic in our in our podcast quite a lot. Um, and Ben's exactly right. Say it as it is. Don't be someone you're not. And one thing that I would touch on that, that we haven't touched on just yet is understand your capabilities, because if you are getting five no's in a row because you're trying to take on a 15 new build, you know, 15 house new build site, in, in a greenfield area and it's your first project it probably is a little bit out of your capabilities so understanding your capabilities and being real with yourself um and one last final thing that i would say is is actually you know you bringing the time and the you know the effort and you know for me the the right investors should just be looking at you and going when shit hits the fan are they going to dig really deep and finish this off and that's for me, what it fund fundamentally boils down to. So if you can be open, candid, trustworthy and honest with them, that's more valuable than being the best developer in the whole world. If you're a little bit, you know, salesy and 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 slippery and you've got a shiny suit. So for me, it's just about being a real person. Problems happen. It's about how you deal with them uh, and, you know, being, you know, backing yourself to 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 commit to that and, and you know, put your cards on the table and say, look, I haven't done that, like Ben said. But I've got these consultants that can help me from a planning, from a you know architectural, from a delivery or whatever it perspective. And you're going to learn, and they're going to learn too. But that's a very good yeah. question. Yeah, it is. And and don't call it other people's money. Um, the amount of yeah. training platforms and networking events where you know it's all about you know ha working with other people's money. It's just it's a huge sort of sales tactic. You know, for for, for our from our perspective 
they're investment partners that they're in it with you. It's, it's a partnership. Um, it's not just you versus them and, and you're using their money to sort of gain advantage. It is a, it is a transaction that is back and forth. They want the opportunities to invest and, and make returns on their money as much as you need cash to develop and, and, and do the developments and build the property portfolios that you want to do. But it's, it's a partnership and it's an investment partnership. It's not working with other people's money. That, um, that reminds me, Ben, we need to book in our photo shoot of ourselves topless on our Bentleys. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure that'll put people off more so than anything from me, not necessarily you. Um, you and Roger, um, thanks very much. Hi, guys. What percentage interest are you having to offer private investors at the moment if you are taking capital as a loan rather than <laughs> offering them equity in the project? Um, we touched on it, well, I touched on it briefly just a minute ago. It kind of depends on the on the asset and the security that, that they have and the the loan to value and exposure that they have within that that asset um you know you you might be paying anywhere between six and twenty percent but it depends on on what i've just said you know that what is the project project that they're investing in um what's the loan to value what um what risk is there and effectively it comes down to that risk profile um it's not a, a straightforward answer, which you're probably yeah. looking for. I mean, we we could we could sort of scenario a vanilla a vanilla development that we would do where the investor comes in to take up the rest of the capital stack on top of the debt. We would we would look to pay anywhere between sort of ten and fourteen percent, depending on the risk of the of the particular scheme. You know, we'd we'd like to think we're fairly low risk as a delivery team, and then it's just down to the project. Um, Wallingford is obviously a grade two listed building with potential problems. So we're paying a little bit more than that. But the reason we're actually paying more is not because of the risk, you know, additional risk of the scheme, because we've delivered something like 30 houses in a, in a close succinction with this de uh, developer. But it's actually because the investor could get similar elsewhere. So it was kind of we either borrow it or we need to find someone else. Um, so similar back to that point. It's a moving target with any deal. And sometimes you're actually competing with what they can get elsewhere. So we've got a few lenders that can get middle of teens, high teens elsewhere, and it's got to be the right scheme for them to come in for us. Um, but then typically I would say on average between sort of 10 and 12% on a second charge, quite vanilla deal is what we would expect to pay. Yeah. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, it's been yeah, a really good episode. Hopefully people have got lots of value from the conversation we actually really love those types of questions coming in you know we spent a good 10 15 minutes going through all of those and and you know we would rather answer questions that you want to know about rather than just telling you what we've been up to over the last you know <laughs> week or so um so keep them coming in um thank you very much for tuning in um we're here every friday at 5 p.m and if you're listening on podcast platforms um hopefully we will be up to date very very soon so have a great weekend everyone and see you next week and maybe next week we'll get a question that we can't answer maybe there's the challenge see ya bye bye